Hey everyone, we're back for another episode of Ask GN, and this is our last one before flying out to Computex, or Taipei for Computex. We might do one there, but I'm not sure. It's gonna be pretty crazy. The first question for this episode, I can't remember which video I saw it on, but I do remember it being asked by one of the regulars, so maybe Leo DS or Street Guru. But whoever it was asked how much variance there is in testing data, and so the, the question was basically, uh, you guys run three tests for parity on all the FPS benchmarks, is there that much variance? The answer is yes. So uh, a lot of these other outlets will present data that's maybe 22 games tested or 30 games benchmarked or something like that. And that's just an absurd amount of benchmarks to run. Unless they have multiple systems running, it's normally not really feasible in the review time that we have. Uh, so if you run, I, I could certainly run more benchmarks if we only did one pass per game. But the thing is with these, even the automated benchmarks, there's still a variance of sometimes one to three FPS. And that's a big deal when you might be comparing things that are one to three FPS different. So it just, it depends on the game and the throttling, where the game throttles, if it's more intensive on one component or the other. If you're testing GPUs and it's more intensive on uh, the CPU, then you're gonna hit CPU throttles. And so if the CPU boosts or does any uh, energy control, which we turn all that stuff off, then you'll see fluctuations there. But normally it's only a couple FPS, so not enough to be an invalid tool for the test suite, but enough where you want to run it multiple times. And uh, that's just because if maybe the first test, at card A tests at 76 FPS and card B tests at 73 FPS, that looks like a pretty reasonable difference but uh, over multiple task passes, they might average out and be the same or very close to the same. So yes, there is actually difference and it is important to do multiple passes, especially, and this is the important part, with the frame time. So if you, anyone who's doing frame time testing should do multi-pass testing because uh, especially with the 1% and 0.1% lows that we use, 0.1% might only be a couple frames. That might be like five frames for the entire test sequence. So that's a pretty low sample, small sample size. Uh, doing multiple tests will smooth out that data and make sure that from one to the next it looks consistent. And if it's inconsistent in one of the passes, we know we need to run it a few more times just to try and understand what's going on. If we can't reprodu reproduce that inconsistency, then we know that it's basically an outlier and we discard that particular piece of data. So that hopefully answers that question. The next question is uh, Mark Rochot who says, Dude, to benefit from the new GTX 1080, Am I going to need a new CPU and motherboard? My current CPU is an i5-4670 non-K. I've been saving up for a Rift. Uh, my current GPU is a 780. And then some other words. I'm just making sure there's no other questions in here. Do I need to save for a whole new machine if I want to see benefits from the 1080? Uh, so I haven't tested this yet, but I can tell you from really brief testing I just did on Total War Warhammer, which our benchmarks aren't up for that yet, really brief testing there using a 5930K, which is more powerful than the 4670. Uh, the 5930K at 4.2 gigahertz versus 3.6 or 8 gigahertz had a 15 or 20 FPS swing, and that was with a GTX 1080. So what that tells us is that in the very least, frequency in that particular game has a huge impact and will throttle the GPU. Uh, in, if, if you sort of extrapolate that, any other games that act similarly that are maybe CPU bound, a lot of racing games are CPU bound, like Grid and Dirt, those are instances where you will be bottlenecking the GTX 1080 on a 4670 because we were bottlenecking it on a 5930. So that would be certainly a consideration. The 4670 is still a good CPU, uh, but I, I need to test it more personally. We, we are working on that, but it'll be a, at least a few weeks till it gets up because of this Computex trip. It is something that you may end up replacing though, so just be aware of that. The next question, Zero Sami, 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 who says, hi, recently I switched to a mini ITX low-end motherboard, but the former overclock I sustained on my R9 290 GPU couldn't be achieved on this new board. What could cause this? I only switched the motherboard and nothing else, so I know for sure it's the motherboard, but why? It's possible, depending on what you had for your previous board, it's possible that maybe there were additional phases or something, the better power cleaning going on that was stabilizing your clock. So that would work on stabilizing voltage supply to the GPU. In that case, 
uh, maybe that's what it was, but that's not super common uh, for a change like that to, to destroy an overclock. It could also be maybe the, I don't know, maybe the PCIe lanes are handled differently or something like that, but I, that doesn't really, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So I would probably suspect two things. I would look at BIOS or UEFI and see if there's anything in there that handles PCIe timings or latency or PCIe bus clock or something like that, bus speed. Um, that would be one place to look. The next place to look would be uh, the, the power delivery design on the new board versus the old one and see if the old one is better. And on many ITX, that may be the case because they're really limited on space. So uh, those are the two places I would look. Of course, also look at your CPU clock because maybe, well, depends on what you mean by you can't achieve the same clock. Uh, it may be the case, though, for gaming FPS that you were overclocked on one board and you're not on the new one for the CPU. That would impact it, too. But if you're just straight not seeing the new clock be achieved on the GPU, then it's one of the first two issues I thought of. Uh, the next part of this question was, also, I crossfired R9-290 with an R9-390 in my friend's high-end machine for fun to see performance scaling. I noticed in the GPU panel that the second card ran at X4 or by 4 or 4 tap PCIe noting that my friend's rig has a Devil's Canyon i7. Uh, that sounds like a motherboard, potentially motherboard thing. So I don't, again, don't know what motherboard this is. It's not listed, but um, boards will, the, even though it's, there's a full length PCIe slot that would normally be called X16, even on Newegg or Amazon, a lot of those slots, even if there's four on a board, a lot of those slots will only be electrically wired for by four or by eight. And uh, that's basically so they can put a full slot to fit the cards but with Crossfire, you may end up running like a X, X8, X4, X4 or something like that. Um, so it's possible that the slot used was just not wired electrically for a by 16 setup. But if it's a full by 16 slot, you also need to check the manual and make sure that it's not suggesting that you run a different slot for SLI or Crossfire because that is also something that happens. Uh, next question, final question. Homer Thompson says, Steve, what do you make of the price inflation we've seen in GPUs the last five years? In 2011, a GTX 560 Ti was sold for 250. In 2012, it doubled for 500 for a full size. The GK104 GTX 680, $50 price increase to 550 for the Nvidia Uncut GM204, and then another increase to $700 for the equivalent Uncut GP104 in the 1080. How much until we're paying $350 for the small GM206 equivalent? And GTX 960. Uh, yeah, that's a real concern. So the price gains are, there's a few things. I'm not 100% sure what I think of this just yet. I'm still thinking about it. But one thing is these cards, like the, the 560 Ti GPU equivalent of today, they're a lot more powerful and the games aren't necessarily growing in their demands, a lot of the games anyway. So um, I guess the, you can get away with a low end or mid range card a lot better now than you used to be able to. So that's one thing that might help the companies justify the price increases. The next thing is uh, just a general competition, um, I guess, misalignment. So because NVIDIA is not super threatened right now in their market share, they, they have a ton of market share. And just strictly speaking to gaming PCs, we're not counting consoles here, gaming PCs, NVIDIA's AIB presence is 70 something percent. So they're certainly not feeling the, the threat to lower their prices. And these putting pressure on the low-end market, but they've always been there. Now, another thing that I think is more relevant than that is uh, Intel and AMD with their APUs, they're both really pushing this low-end market. So the, the demand for maybe a GT740 or something, that demand has kind of evaporated because the reason you'd buy one of those is if you didn't have onboard video or you didn't have one that was good enough to play some simple games, but you also didn't want a full, full mid-range or low-end GPU. Uh, you would buy something like a GT740 or whatever. Now you don't need to do that because the CPUs have these IGPs, APUs have their, uh, their GPU components, so those kind of invalidate the need for a lot of the really cheap GPUs, and I think that probably creates a weird gap in the market where now the low-end GPUs are priced a little higher than they used to be, and that, of course, raises the price of everything else. But, um, of course, there's also just general inflation. But I'm not 100% sure what I think of that just yet. I do. I will say that $700 for a Founders Edition 1080 is too much. 
uh, but the $600 price point seems good if any of the AIB partners actually reach that price point when they make their cards. So that seems good. 700 is certainly cheap. Uh, we don't know what AMD stuff will cost yet, but we'll see and, and analyze that once we're reviewing the Polaris stuff, Polaris 10. So that's all I got for you this week. As always, Patreon link the post the video if you like this content. We'll be in Taiwan, China, and Macau next week, and we're going to be doing uh, factory tours, headquarters tours, and the Computex show floor. And we'll probably do some kind of random walking around the giant, empty, abandoned mall in Shenzhen. So that'll be fun. But check back for that. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.